new chapter of Esperanza Rising, and we're getting so close to the end. So close to the end. Um, I'm so I'm really excited because I've read this book before, but it's been a long time, so I can't actually remember what happens at the end. <laughs> oh, no. All right, well. Never mind. Okay. Um, so we are in Los Esparagos, Asparagus chapter. Martha was right. The strikers were more organized than ever. They handed out flyers in front of every store. They painted the sides of old barns with their slogans and held big meetings at the farm. For those who continued to work, there were still jobs. But Esperanza, Esperanza could hear the tightness and worry in her neighbors' voices. She worried too about what would happen if she didn't have a job. Uh, Troy, that's enough. Asparagus would be a long season, sometimes up to 10 weeks, but it had to be picked before high temperatures touched the valley in June. Strikers knew if they could slow down the workers, it would affect the growers. So when the tender stalks were ready, the strikers were ready too. Esperanza got on the flatbread truck with Hortensia and Josefina for the first day of packing. The company had sent a man with a gun to ride on the truck with them for protection, they said. But the gun frightened Esperanza. When they arrived at the sheds, a crowd of women erupted into shouting and booing. They carried the signs that says, Huegla, Huegla, strike. Among them were Marta and her friends, and they were yelling, Help us feed our children. We must all join together if we are to all eat. Save your countrymen from starving. When Esperanza saw their menacing faces, she wanted to run back to the safety of the camp, do laundry, clean diapers, anything but this. She wanted to tell them that her mother was sick, that she had to pay bills. She wanted to explain to them about Abuelita and know that she had to find a way to get some money to her so she could travel. Then maybe they'd understand why she needed her job. She wanted to tell them she did not want anyone's children to starve. But she knew it was no matter. It would not matter. The strikers only listened if you agreed with them. She reached for Hortensia's hand and pulled her close. Josefina marched towards the shed, looking straight ahead. Hortensia and Esperanza stayed close behind, never letting go of each other. One of the women from their camp called out, We make less money packing asparagus than you do when you pick cotton. Leave us alone. Our children are hungry, too. When the guard wasn't looking, one of the strikers picked up a rock and threw it at the woman, barely missing her head, and the workers all hurried towards the shed. The strikers stayed near the road, but Esperanza's heart was still... Esperanza's heart was still beating wildly as she and the women took their places at the asparagus, to pack the asparagus. All day, she sorted and bundled the delicate spears. She heard their chanting and their threats. That night at dinner, Alfonso and Juan told how they had the same problem in the fields. Strikers waited for them, and they had to cross picket lines to get to work. Once in the fields, they were safe, protected by the guards the company had sent. But the lugs of asparagus that were sent back to the sheds had to be taken across the picket line. And the strikers often slipped surprises beneath the harvest. The strike continued for days. One afternoon... As Josefina took a handful of asparagus from a crate, a large rat jumped out at her. So this is what, um, so I'm going to reread this. Right here it says, and I was a little confused, and I go, what the heck did they mean by this? So it says, um, you know, the, the harvest had to, but the lugs of asparagus that were sent back to the sheds had to be taken across the picket line, Okay. So across the line of people who are standing there having a fuss, saying, you know, we don't, we deserve better money, we deserve better conditions, right? Um, and it said they often slip surprises beneath the harvest. Well, a lot of times we tend to think of surprises as good things, right? And I was like, what kind of surprises were they slipping in the harvest? That was my question. I said, what that, what does that mean? And then I kept reading, and it gave me some examples. So what was the first example of a surprise that waited for them in the harvest? Hale? A rat jumped out. A rat. OK. 
Okay, so somebody stuck a rat in there. Okay, um, a few days later, Esperanza heard a terrible scream from woman to woman, women and several writhing gopher snakes slithered out of the crate. They found razor blades and shards of glass in the field bins. And the women, usually efficient and quick to unpack the asparagus, slowed down or hesitant to grab the vegetables from their boxes. Okay, um, so at first the surprises were pretty harmless, right? Like a rat is gross, but it's not really going to do much damage, right? And same with the gopher snakes. It's kind of like, whoa, that was surprising, but it's, the gopher snakes aren't going to hurt you. But then razor blades and shards of glass, those could really hurt the workers, right? And that, I, I think, uh, um, it is where the strikers are, um, you know, they're taking out their frustrations on the company on the people who are working, right? Because they need to make money. It's not like they agree that, oh, yeah, we should get that poor pay and terrible housing. But they're just like, we need to feed our family. And so they're kind of being attacked for things that they don't really have control over. Like the strikers want them to join them. But what, Louise? Um, it has nothing to do with Okay, then you don't get to talk to me right now. Um, Kale? Kale? Um, it's just a kind of snake. Um, um, well, I think they could if they really want, like, but just little. But yeah, it's not gonna hurt you. They're they're not poisonous. Yeah, but anyway. All right, shh, Louise, please. Okay, that's gonna be mine. Thank you. Okay, so, so now the women who are unpacking the asparagus, they're nervous and they're scared because the strikers were actually putting in things in there that could be dangerous to them, right? Um, when several of them heard a rattling from beneath a pile of stocks, the supervisors took the entire crate out to the yard, dumped it, and found an angry rattlesnake inside. Oh, those are dangerous. Yeah. It was a miracle that no one was bitten by that snake, said Hortensia that night at dinner. They were all gathered in one cabin, eating caldo de albondigas, meatball soup. Did you see it? asked Isabel. Yes, said Esperanza. We all saw it. It was frightening, but the supervisor cut off its head with the hoe. Isabel cringed. A hoe? What the heck is a hoe? Like to um to dig in the gardens and stuff. Oh, yeah. So, like, yeah. so, so yeah, it's like make the rows stuff. They it, it so it's got like a long um handle like a shovel, okay. And then the end is kind of just like a square kind of thing, like for digging. Um, just for making like uh, a and little trench. A line, like no, it's not a pitchfork. Um, okay, it's just it's just like a square that then you can turn and um, I'll look up a picture for you. My my drawing today is less than are, <laughs> but um, anyway, so I'll, I'll look up a picture and show you guys in a minute what a hoe looks like. Um, I know. So you have a little bit better understanding. Okay, well, if you know, wonderful, right? But if you don't, let's... okay. Isabel cringed. Can't they do anything about the strikers? Asked Hortensia. It's a free country, said Miguel. Besides, the strikers are careful. As long as they stay near the road and the guards don't actually see them do anything aggressive, then no. Not as not much anyone can do. It's same as the railroad. I pass the picket lines every day and listen to the yelling and the insults. It's the yelling all day long that bothers me, said Hortensia. Remember, do not respond to them, said Alfonso. Things will get better. Papa, said Miguel, things will get worse. Okay, so Alfonso is saying, oh, things are going to get better. And Miguel says, no. Things aren't going to get better. Things are going to get 
worse. Now, I want to know his reasoning, so I'm hoping he explains that, right? So let's listen to what he thinks, because I think he's got, like, on the right track. What, Luis, is it on parts of the story? Okay. The strikers and how the, the it's going to get off. Oh, Bonzo said it's going to get better, and Miguel said no, it's going to get worse. Oh, because because of they are going to be worse. That's how you know they're going to be worse. They're going to what? They're going to pay. I didn't hear you. They're going to do what? They're going to do more things. Oh. Then that's how. Okay, so you think they're gonna they're, they're gonna do worse things and more things? Okay. Papa said, Miguel, the things will get worse. Have you seen the cars and the trucks coming through the the pass and the mountains? Every day, more and more people. Some of them, they say, will pick cotton for five and six cents a pound, and will pick produce for less. People cannot survive on such low wages. Amy. Where will it end, said Josefina? Everyone will starve if people work for less and less money. Wait. Is what? her mom still in the hospital? Yes, her mom's still in the hospital. So that's one reason why Esperanza is so worried. Not only does she need to be able to buy food and stuff, but she also needs to help pay the bills. And the electricity bill. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know how much, but but yeah, like like the bills. Amy, go go away. Go around. Um and and pay uh the bills for the hospital right because that costs a lot of money uh, and she has like the horses that from the like, dust that got on her lungs mm -hmm. okay Shh. all right where will it end said Josefina. everyone will starve if people work for less and less money that's the striker's point said esperanza no one said anything. Folks, clink, forks clinked on the plate. Pepe, who was sitting in Esperanza's lap, dropped a meatball on the floor. Are we going to starve, asked Isabel. No, mija, said Isabel. How could anyone starve here with so much food around us? Esperanza had grown so accustomed to the strikers chanting when she picked up asparagus that the moment it stopped, she looked up from her work as if something was wrong. Hortensia, do you hear that? What? The silence. There's no more yelling. The other women on the line looked at each other. They couldn't see the street from where they stood as they moved to the other end of the shed, cautiously looking out to where the strikers usually stood. In the distance, a caravan of gray buses and police cars headed fast towards the shed, dust flying in their wake. Immigration, said Josefina. It's a sweep. Okay, so um, they're coming through to see uh, if people are in the country legally or not. And I think their primary objective here is probably to, to mostly go after the strikers, right? Um, because those are the people causing problems. But they're pro but they're going to go but they're going to go over anybody. Because then here's another thing: all those people coming in who are so desperate for work that they'll work for less and less money are just going to swoop right in and take the jobs. Okay. The picket signs lay on the ground, discarded, like a mass of marbles that had already been hit. The strikers scattered into the field. The strikers scattered into the fields and towards the boxcars on the track, anyway, where they could hide. The buses and cars screeched to a, stop, a stop, and immigration officials and police carrying clubs jumped out and ran after them. Women in the packing shed huddled together, protected by the company's guard. What about us? said Esperanza, her eyes riveted on the ground who caught the strikers on the guards, sorry, her eyes riveted on the guards who caught the strikers and shoved them back towards the buses. They would surely come into the sheds next with so many Mexicans working here. Her fingers desperately clenched Hortensia's arm. I cannot leave mama. Hortensia heard the panic in her voice. No, no, Esperanza, they are not here for us. The growers need the workers. That's why the company guards us. All right, they're trying to get rid of the problem, the strikers. Right, so that they can continue to pay people such um, low wages. Several immigration officials, accompanied by police, began searching the platform, turning over boxes and dumping out field bins. 
Hortensia was right. They ignored the workers in their stained aprons, their hands still holding the green asparagus. Finding no stalkers on the dock, strikers on the dock, they jumped back and hurried to where a crowd was being loaded into the bus buses. Americana, Americana, yelled one woman, and she began to unfold some papers. One of the officials took the papers from her and tore them into pieces. Get on the bus, he ordered. What will they do with them, asked Esperanza. They will take them to Los Angeles and put them on the train to El Paso, Texas, then to Mexico, said Josefina. But some of them are citizens, said Esperanza. It doesn't matter. They're causing problems to the government. They're talking about forming a farm workers union. And the government and the grow growers don't like that. What about their families? How will they know? Word gets out. It is sad. They leave the buses parked at the station until late at night with those they captured on board. Families don't want to be separated from their loved ones and usually go with them. That's the idea. They call it voluntary deportation, but it's not much of a choice, right? It's either get on the bus with your family or stay here by your, you know, without them at that point. Either you guys choose to leave with your family that we've already taken, um, or yeah, or you're going to be here by yourself, and we'll probably come back and get you in another raid. <laughs> Two immigration officials positioned themselves in front of the shed. The others left on buses. As Franz and the other women watched the despondent faces in the window disappear. Slowly, the women re reassembled on the line and began to pack again. It had all lasted only a few minutes. What happens now, asked Esperanza. La Migra will keep their, hand, their eyes open for strikers that might come back, said Josefina, noticing, nodding towards the two men stationed nearby. And we'll go back to work and feel thankful it's not us on that bus. Esperanza took a breath and went back to her spot. She was relieved, but still imagined the anguish of the strikers. Troubled thoughts stayed in her mind. Something seemed very wrong about sending people away from their own free country because they'd spoken their minds. She noticed that she needed more bands to wrap around the asparagus bundles and walked toward back to the back of the docks to get them. Within a maze of tall crates, she searched for the thick rubber bands some of the boxes had been tossed over by the immigration officials, and she bent down to set one straight. She sucked in her breath, startled by what was in front of her. Marta was huddled in a corner, holding her fingers to her lips, her eyes begging for help. She whispered, please, Esperanza, don't tell. I can't get caught. I must take care of my mother. Esperanza stood frozen for a moment, for a moment remembering Marta's meanness that first day in the truck. If she helped her and someone found out, Esperanza would be on the next bus herself. She couldn't risk it and started to say no. But then she thought about Martha and her mother holding hands and couldn't imagine them being separated from each other. And besides, they were both citizens. They had every right to be there. She turned around and headed back to where the others were working. No one paid any attention to her. They were all busy talking about the sweep. She picked up a bundle of asparagus, several burlap sacks from a stack and a dirty apron that someone had left on a hook. She quietly um, wandered back to Martha's hiding place. La Migra is still out front, she said in a hushed voice. They will probably leave in an hour when the sheds close. She handed the apron and put the, in the asparagus to Martha. When you leave, put on the apron and carry the asparagus so you look like a worker, just in case anyone stops you. Gracias, whispered Martha. I'm sorry I misjudged you. Shh, said Esperanza, repositioning the crates and drop, draping the burlap sacks across their tops so Martha couldn't be seen. Esperanza called Josefina. Where are you? We need the rubber bands. Esperanza stuck her head around the corner and saw Josefina with her hands on her hips, waiting. Coming, she called. She grabbed a bundle of bands and went back to work as if nothing had happened. Esperanza lay in bed that night and listened to the others in the front room talk about the sweeps and the deportation. They went to every major grower and put hundreds of strikers on buses, said Juan. Some say they did it to create more jobs for those coming from the east, said Josefina. We are lucky the company needs us right now. If they didn't, we'd be next. We've been loyal to the company, and the company will be loyal to us, said Alfonso. I'm just glad it's over, said Hortensia. It's not over, said Miguel. In time, they will be back, especially if they have families here. They will reorganize and they will be stronger. There will come a time when we will have to decide all over again whether to join them or not. 
Esperanza tried to go to sleep, but the day spun in her mind. She was glad she kept working and thankful that her camp had voted not to strike. But she knew that under different circumstances, it would have been could have been her on that bus. And then what would Mama have done? Her thoughts jumped back and forth. Some of these people did not deserve their fate today. How was it the United States could send people to Mexico who'd never even lived there? She stopped thinking, she couldn't stop thinking about Martha. It didn't matter if Esperanza agreed with her cause or not. No one should have to be separated from her family. Had Martha made her way back to the Strikers farm without getting caught? Had she found her mother? For some reason, Esperanza had to know. The next morning, she begged Miguel to drive by the farm. The field was surrounded by the chain link fence, but no one was protecting the entrance this time. All the evidence of people she'd seen before, but not one person was to be seen. Laundry waved on the clotheslines. Plates with rice and beans sat on crates and swarmed with busy flies. Shoes were lined up in front of tents as if waiting for someone to step into them. The breeze picked up loose newspapers and floated them across the field. It was quiet and desolate, except for the goat still tied to the tree, bleeding for freedom. Immigration has been here too, said Miguel. He got out of the truck, walked over to the tree, and untied the goat. Esperanza looked out over the field that used to be crawling with people who thought they could change things, who were trying to get the attention of the growers and the government to make conditions better for themselves and for her. So, Haiti, please stop. More than anything, Esperanza hoped that Martha and her mother were together, but now there would be no way for her to find out. Maybe Mar Martha's aunt would heal it here eventually. Something colorful caught her eye. Dangling from a tree branch were the remnants of the little don donkey pinata that she'd given to the children. Its tissues, streamers fluttered in the breeze. It'd been beaten with a stick, its insides torn out. I think that's the end of that chapter. We managed to read the whole thing. Woohoo!